Welcome to Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom. I'm Peter Gross, co-host of the original Wild Kingdom with Marlon Perkins and Jim Fowler. Most of us have seen movies or television shows where sharks have been portrayed as marauders who prey on unsuspecting swimmers or smaller fish in the sea. But many Wild Kingdom episodes illustrate how sharks and other predators are an important part of the food chain in our underwater world. Oceans cover 70% of our planet, yet we still have much to learn about this important ecosystem. Modern technology has enhanced our ability to study the oceans with minimal disruption to their habitat. Human involvement and recent legislation to protect underwater creatures allow for the resurgence of these many species. There's more good news to come in the Wild Kingdom, so sit back and enjoy Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom right here on RFD-TV. Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom is presented by Mutual of Omaha, the people who pay. Welcome to Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom. When most people think of wild animals, they usually think of South America or Africa. But some of the most fascinating wildlife I've ever encountered is found in the far corner of the map here in Australia. The coastal islands are home for many animals. And when Marine Land of Australia planned a voyage through some of them, they invited Tom Allen and me to go along. Tom is a student of zoology and had a special interest in recording the behavior and sounds of the unusual animals of the area. Some of the animals we saw sound completely different from those found anywhere else in the world. Here's an example of what I mean. We found that animal on the first island we explored. Now here is an even stranger one. That's one of the most incredible sounds I've ever heard in the wild. And you only hear it in the dead of night. It's even more amazing when you see the animal that makes it. The islands were full of surprises for Tom and me. And we observed all kinds of animals there. Koala, kangaroo, and some sea lions that didn't let us share their beach for long. There was also much bird life, including mutton birds and, oddly enough, penguins. In the water around the islands, we found all sorts of undersea life, like the destructive crown of thorns starfish. We boarded the marine land research ship and began a voyage that would take us to the coral islands of the Great Barrier Reef. But our trip began here in the islands of the south. We're anchored just offshore of a large coastal island and the gulls here are perfect subjects for my slow motion camera. These graceful birds are ocean scavengers. They eat almost anything and they've been following our ship for days, looking for handouts. Seagulls are built like gliders, with long, tapering wings that catch every breeze. They can soar for hours without tiring. Watching them becomes almost hypnotic, but there's more life ashore. This island was specially selected by John Reynolds, a director of Marine Land of Australia, and the leader of our voyage. He chose it for an experiment Tom Allen and I planned to conduct ashore with one of the island's more unusual inhabitants. But first, we hope to observe some of the wildlife here. The launch is ready and the sea is as calm as a harbor. That's because our ship is anchored on the island's lee side. We're sheltered here from the prevailing wind and waves of the South Pacific Ocean. 
These southern Australian waters are much colder than the coastal waters to the north since they're farther from the equator. But the day is warm and perfect for exploring. We're beaching on a narrow tongue of land jutting out from the island. It'll be a short walk across to the open ocean side, to a beach that is a rookery for Australian sea lions. This is the breeding season a time when you enter the rookery with care. The bulls have staked out territories and they don't like trespassers. We've moved beyond the boundary that marks the edge of his breeding ground, but it looks like we may be entering another bull's territory. Once you're off his patch of sand, he won't bother you. Each bull wins his territory and battles with others. And the larger the territory, the more females the bull can gather. Earlier on this beach, the young were born. They grow fast on a diet of rich milk. This rookery is a permanent one because these animals don't migrate like other sea lions. They enter the ocean to fish or simply to play, but they don't wander far from the beach of their birth. Our experiment will take place on another shore of this island, and it's time we moved on. We'll cross to the other side and concede this beach to the sea lion bull. John Reynolds said this island was full of life, and he was right. On the grassy plain ahead, a flock of emus. We should be able to move closer. Emus aren't easily frightened. They're large birds, almost as tall as a man. And with those long legs, they could run off in a flash. But they're usually more curious than cautious. And while they graze, they're giving us careful scrutiny. An island seems a strange place to find flightless birds, but their ancestors probably walked here over an ancient land bridge. Now the emus are here permanently, and so are some other island residents, kangaroos. You often find emus together with kangaroos. They're both grazers. Kangaroos come in all sizes, and big ones can leap 30 feet. It won't be long before the hot sun drives the kangaroos off this meadow into the shade of the nearby trees. We'll leave the kangaroos to finish their grazing. It would be easy to watch these fascinating animals for hours. But our destination is still ahead, a beach that lies beyond a small forest of eucalyptus trees. On a high branch, Tom has spotted an animal that eats eucalyptus leaves as practically its only food, a koala, carrying her youngster on her back. You only find koalas where you find these trees and our path to the beach passes beneath branches full of the little animals. There was much more of the island yet to explore, but we found it difficult to leave the amusing little koalas. These trees are full of koalas, and you don't have to search long to spot one in the branches. That sounds like a distress call. We must be making him nervous. This is a young male, and he's extremely excited by our presence. He seems to feel threatened, and he keeps moving, looking for a safer spot.
This is his tree, and he doesn't like anyone coming near it. You never see these animals fall. They're well suited for climbing, with fingers that grip like pliers. The koala's call is one sound I've been eager to study, and it looks like we've found the ideal subject. I'll come back later to record it. These are such appealing, friendly-looking little animals, it seems odd to see one so angry and aggressive. He wants us out of here, and we'll oblige him. Not all the koalas are disturbed by our presence. This female and her youngster hardly seem concerned. What a difference between her and the male we saw. The young koala looks only about six months old. When he was born, this youngster was smaller than a peanut, and he crawled to his mother's pouch, where he stayed for about four months. Now that he's out, he'll remain with his mother till he's a year old, riding on her back as she moves through the branches. She isn't at all afraid of us, but the baby seems to need his mother's security now that we're near. We've reached the edge of the brush where the trees give way to a scrub-covered dune that leads to the sea. This is where our experiment will take place. We've set up a powerful floodlight here earlier where it can shine on a grassy slope dropping down to the beach. On the beach itself, we put another light. Tonight, we'll illuminate this entire area. It's actually the nesting ground of the fairy penguin, even though there aren't any penguins in view now. Some are underground in burrows, hatching their eggs, and their mates are out at sea, feeding. Our lights may let us watch these penguins the one time they're in view when they come ashore after sundown to join their mates in the underground nests. The penguins always return after dark. We're hoping that the bright lights won't bother the returning birds. This simple blind should be cover enough to hide me when they wade ashore. The sun's going down and the penguin should come in just after sunset. The lights have been burning about half an hour, and the penguins are returning to the island. The lights seem to be bothering them a little. They're hesitating as they move onto the beach. But habit is too strong. They're coming in. Fairy penguins are the smallest of the penguins, and they'd be easy game for large birds of prey. That's why they move to their nesting burrows only under cover of darkness. At the rate they're moving, they'll soon reach Marlin at his station on the slope above the beach. It looks like the entire group is ashore. The penguins have moved past Tom's blind on the beach and they're heading inland for the grass just below me where their burrows are dug. These penguins sometimes climb as high as 150 feet above the shoreline. Watching them walk out of the ocean in the dead of night is an incredible sight. The 
The penguins have been fishing for the entire day. They leave the island before sunup, and their first stop after returning to land is this preening station, where they carefully clean their feathers before finding their burrows. You'd think they'd be eager to get home, but a good grooming always comes first. Now they're moving on to their burrows where mates are waiting for a meal of regurgitated fish. The penguins seem slightly confused by the lights, but it hasn't stopped them. Some are moving right past me, climbing the slope to their underground nests. In these burrows, the nesting birds are safe from attack during the day, when their mates leave again to feed. The fairy penguins are home, and it's time for us to continue our voyage. We completed our exploration of the southern islands and continued our voyage around the coast. With calm seas, we soon sailed into the coral islands of the Capricorn Group on the Great Barrier Reef. Here in the warm waters of the Coral Sea, our voyage will end. There's our destination, a low island barely reaching above the waves. We are anchored in the shallows, and with John Reynolds as our guide, we'll swim underwater to the island, searching the coral formations around it. The coral harbors an incredible variety of sea life, but we're looking for one special animal today. We're swimming over a large expanse of staghorn coral, one of the many types that have built up the barrier reef over the course of centuries. These warm, shallow waters are ideal for the tiny coral-building animals whose secretions have gradually made these vast formations. There's all kinds of coral here, including the distinctive plate coral. These growths provide shelter for millions of sea animals. John has spotted the animal we're searching for, an animal that threatens the existence of the coral reefs. The crown of thorn starfish. You handle this star gingerly, or you may get a very painful sting from the spines. The crown of thorns is one of the largest stars, and also one of the most striking in appearance. With the starfish turned over, you can see the hundreds of tube feet that grip the coral as the mouth, here at the center, devours the coral-building animals. Ordinarily, the crown of thorns would be a normal link in the chain of life, but its numbers have increased to plague proportions in some areas where the coral-killing starfish now threatens to eventually destroy the reefs. John is heading back for the ship, and Tom and I will swim for the nearby shore of the small island, where we plan to conduct another nighttime experiment. It always seems an effort just to walk when you first lose the water's buoyancy, but we haven't far to climb. This island rises only a few feet above the waves built by the piling up of broken coral and other debris on top of a reef. We'll leave our gear on the beach as we move inland to explore. But we'll carry along two pieces of equipment we'll need later, our lights. This island is home for several species of birds, and the first of their kind to come here probably carried the seeds that started this forest, providing roosts for thousands of seabirds today.
The branches of the trees have been claimed as the nesting site of the knotty tern. These seabirds come here in great numbers. They're one of the few seabirds to nest in trees, and it's odd to see those webbed feet gripping a branch. The trees are full of noddies. This is where the young are hatched, in nests of leaves and seaweed. Soon the terns will share this island with another animal, one that can't be seen until after sundown. In the dark, this island has come alive with the strangest sounds I've ever heard. With our diving lights, we hope to spot the animals that are making this mournful racket. There, on the ground, a mutton bird. They're landing in the darkness. Just crashing down through the branches overhead. After a long migration, the birds come here to dig nesting burrows in the sandy soil in preparation for the breeding season. That nightmarish noise is actually their courtship cry, a sound I hope to record. Now, once the birds dig their nests on this island, they leave every morning to feed at sea, returning after sundown. You can only see them at night. By knocking on the roof of the burrow, it may be possible to coax a bird out for a better look. It seems to be working. He's starting to come out. racket keeps growing louder and louder throughout the night, reaching a crescendo after midnight. This is one of the strangest sights and sounds I've ever witnessed. Here on this tiny coral island, on our voyage to the Great Barrier Reef. Tom and I stayed on the Great Barrier Reef for several more days, exploring the coral islands that make up one of the world's richest wildlife habitats. It's a largely unspoiled world, and life goes on as it has for centuries. This is one place where man has not yet upset the delicate balances poised for millions of years of evolution. Such unspoiled places are becoming fewer and fewer, and our irreplaceable wildlife heritage is increasingly threatened as man's influence over his environment expands. We must always leave room in our shrinking world for the beauty and incredible variety found in every part of the wild kingdom. Mutual of Omaha, the people who pay, has presented Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom. Mutual of Omaha, helping people find Medicare solutions for over 50 years. To learn more about plan options or how to protect your kingdom, contact us today. Mutual of Omaha, protect your kingdom.